Good evening and uh, welcome to the College of Complexes. My, my name is Tim and uh, we'll be uh, getting started here very quickly. Uh, the college has the following formats. We have a brief announcement period followed by our speaker and then we have a uh, question and answer period followed by our infamous rebuttal period. My name is Tim. I'll be turning this over to Brahm as soon as he's finished collecting your money. We'll now hear from Lisa Spellman, who will uh, enlighten us all about voice. and I am not a musicologist. I'm only going to tell you how I got interested in birds and what happened after that. I started playing music for birds uh, sometime in 1999. I play piano and I'd gone back to playing and I'll spare you the details but I was getting over an affair with a flutist and he was the person, but, but there's, there's a reason, there's always a reason for, for everything, okay? Of course, flutes are the birds in the orchestra, along with the elbows and the saxophones and all this. And he was the one who noticed that the birds were singing along when I was playing the piano. And he left me with that thought, and when I no longer had him to play for, I thought, well, let me check this out. So at the time, I was living on the third floor of Six Flat in Oak Park in an old building, and I could open the windows wide, and I heard these birds, yes they are, singing along. Who the heck are they? I didn't know a sparrow from another sparrow. I didn't know that there were 22 or 25 species of sparrow and I found out later that the sparrows I thought were sparrows were actually weaver finches from the old world, but that's okay. Uh, so I started putting food on the window ledge so that my audience would come to see me and there's no better way to get close up and personal with birds than to feed them. And I guess because I was up in the trees, they weren't as afraid of me as they might have been if I was walking around outside disturbing them. They were coming to me. And it was a wonderful, although brief period, because I had to move. And not because of that. The landlady died on the first floor of the building and I had, I had to move. But it was, it was bliss while it was happening. I, I realized shortly after that started that this was what I was meant to do. A little late in life, and there are no jobs that I know of where you can play music for birds and get paid for it. But this, this is something that I really, really love to do. And the reason why is because the birds participate. They sing along. They listen to the music. And they're very intelligent. I figured they had to be. If I could have those windows wide open and nobody walking by down down below was paying any attention, but the birds heard me and they were paying attention. They had to be smart. Okay. 
So I'm going to move on to a slide. I, I've never done a PowerPoint presentation, so bear with me. Try this. Okay. This is a robin, and I, I have some recording. I don't know if you're going to be able to hear it, but I do have. I did find one with a robin singing. It's a little warm, yeah. Yeah, you get it. Bless you. I saw the microphone. Just put it in. I'll get it. Yeah, put it I'll get it. Would you like some rice pudding? Oh, no, thank you. No, thank you. I'm full as a tank. I can't eat anymore. Oh, this is the babies. No. Well, we've got some budgies in there, too, but... And if the background chorus is always going to be house sparrows, so I they're in the next slide, but they're not singing. This is a house finch. You may have seen these around your neighborhood. These are your photographs. These are these are my photographs. Yeah. And no, no, that's not cardinal. That's a house finch singing. This is not a cardinal. And the music is going to come in. He's going to continue. started with this actually, long before I knew I was going to get started with it. I hadn't played piano for several years. I'd been a musician on the road and then we got off the road. I quit playing. And I was having a terrible time going back because I didn't have an audience. I was so used to performing. And then I started realizing that if you don't start playing piano soon, you're going to be dropping glasses like your mother did in the kitchen. You're losing uh, facility in your hands. So I, I decided, okay, I'm going to bite the bullet. I know I'm not going to sound like Glenn Gould. I'm not even going to sound like I used to sound. I'm going to play. And I was in the same apartment, and I sat down. And I had, at that time, a, a Fender Rhodes piano, which is kind of a different sounding thing. And I started playing the only thing I could remember how to play, and it was a B-flat partita from Bach's, for Bach, the, the prelude to the B-flat B -flat partita, hello. And I'm playing, and a morning dove comes to the window and starts singing, Ooh, 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 ooh. And I'm thinking, oh my God, this is terrible. And I close the window. It's like, goodbye, bird. I don't know exactly how much longer it was before that bird came back, but I think it was two or three years, probably the same bird that I caught singing with. Now I wanted to hear birds singing. And I was playing the aria to the Goldberg Variations which I know is in G. And the dove started singing along. And I'm thinking, are my ears failing me? Or is this dove singing in key with the music? And I knew already that the dove always sang in the key of C, or, or pretty much that. I have absolute pitch. I've been playing since I was two. And I borrowed a couple microphones and started recording the birds, and sure enough, all of them were always in key with the music. And I thought, this is pretty interesting. Did you change keys? Did I change keys? Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, um, I'll tell you about that. Actually, the, if we went back to the house finch, uh, I was playing something, and he started singing along, 
And I remembered what he was singing the day before, and I went to it, and he stopped. Now, that's kind of like, you're listening to something on the radio, and you're singing along, and you're really digging it, and then somebody changes the channel. I never did that to a bird again. But I was playing things in different keys, and they were always singing along. And they would only come in when they could be in key with the music. They're not singing the music that I'm playing. They're singing their own song, but they're always in key. So let's see if we can hear the house of the morning dove. Hold on a second. but some of these recordings are not so great. So let's them and try to teach them to sing music that they had written. But as far as people just playing music and having birds sing along, which is something that Rothenberg him, himself has done, he plays a, a variety of wind instruments and so he jams with the birds. But I'm kind of like a, a little orchestra, so I play background music for the birds. That's the way I look at it. 
But anyway, I couldn't find anything. So I did find that Luis Baptista, who was an ornithologist and, and was very interested in music and birds, uh, had just died about an, uh, a year or so before I discovered all this. So I couldn't write him. And I did write Donald Kruzma, who was a wonderful ornithologist who studies songs, bird songs, and he passed me on to Patricia Gray, and I had already sent her tapes too, and nobody was getting back to me, and I figured, okay, it's because I'm not an ornithologist, I'm not a musicologist, that's okay, I, I can live with that. The thing that was bothering me was that birds, they're not always singing, they have calls, they have songs, and they make a distinction between the two, as we do when we listen to them, but they were always in key no matter what. And I started to realize that when I was walking out of the symphony, every, the whole crowd was talking in the key of the last chord that the orchestra played. So I thought, okay, the birds are doing the same thing we are. We make a distinction between talk and music. If there was background music going on here, we would all be speaking in the key of the music or with, within within it, because music is, I, I suppose, it's it's a vibration that we have to respond to, and that's probably why it, make, it yes. makes such an emotional impact on us. It's not just like something that we hear that's nice. And I'll get it's you actually got a physical. Impact. So, okay, let's see if we can get the crow to sing. Crows. Crows. Well, he's gonna call. He's When I, I work downtown, and so I figured, okay, I've got house sparrows now, and they come up to the window, and I feel like, I feel like uh, Snow White, because they all come up. They're so happy to see me. But what do they do during the day? You know, when I'm when I'm gone, I only see them when they come up to the window. I know they've got other things to do besides come to the window and, and eat birdseed or whatever it is I'm feeding them. So I started looking for birds downtown. And uh, I was feeding them, of course, to get them to pay attention to me. And then these other sparrows started showing up. It's like they've got these racing stripes on top of their head, and I'm thinking, what the heck is this? I, I get a field guide, and that's a white-throated sparrow. And they're actually becoming, they're wintering now in, in the Chicago area. We've, we've had them in Grant Park for the last two or three winters. A whole breeding flock on their way north will come through oh, sometime in late April. And they come, they come down through the lakefront by the hundreds and they're singing like crazy. And I wish I had a... I couldn't go through all my, my songs to get you. They have a wonderful sing, a song though. It's, it's called, the Ninamic for it, Ninamic, is uh, Oh Sam Peabody Peabody Peabody, or Oh Sweet Canada, Canada, Canada. It's really a, a beautiful song. All right. It's 
interesting about oh. This is a white crown sparrow. Oh, wow. Nice. This is a song sparrow. And they have a number of different songs. And this is a Lincoln sparrow. And the, all, all of these you will be able to see in the city of Chicago. It's actually easier to see them down here than it is to see them out in the woods. Because they're confined to these little park spaces and, and they're foraging on the ground and you can actually you can actually see these birds. So I was starting to wonder more about what what are these birds doing. So I, I took some classes at uh, Morton Arboretum. They have, I think the Botanic Garden used to have birding classes too, but they, they no longer do. And uh, I wanted, I just wanted to know what was going on with birds, and I, I've been fascinated and <laughs> crazy with birds uh, ever since. I never would have learned to play all this music if I hadn't been playing for the birds. I went through all the Mozart sonatas. I mean, every single one. Usually a teacher will assign you one or two, and that's, well, that's it for Mozart. And I had played, when I was younger, I had played a couple uh, concerti, but to go through the entire Mozart sonatas. And the reason why I was doing this was because I wanted to keep mixing it up for the birds. I wanted them to stay interested. I didn't want, and between the two, me and the birds, I didn't want to be bored either. But uh, it, it's, it's really phenomenal what, what they've given me back for paying attention to me. The other thing, this is a horned grebe, and I, I took this picture last week right off of Monroe, Har Monroe Harbor, and it's still in, um, it's still winter, non-breeding too much. So you, you won't see the, the horns that kind of stick up when, when they're in breeding plumage, but this was right off of Monroe Harbor. These are some common mergansers. Oh, I'm sorry, red breasted for Kansas. And also right off of uh, Monroe Harbor. And this is a downy woodpecker, and there are a lot of them in the city. You'll see these. Black capped chickadees are here too, although I am told that they're going to be replaced by Carolina chickadees. There's species creep going on with with climate change, and they're, they're estimating 35 miles, I'm thinking a year, that birds that were normally south of us are moving up. When I first got, in, got interested in birds, somebody told me that morning doves didn't used to be around here, I don't know how many years ago, maybe 30, 40 years ago. They're very common now. So this has been going on for a while. And red-winged blackbirds are back in town now. You may have already seen them. So, what am I doing here? <laughs> I've forgotten my talk. Oh, as far as the Enkinus thing goes, uh, I've also noticed that the cicadas at Ravinia are also in key with the music. Not only, not only are they rubbing their legs together, and and uh, they're they're also in with the uh, dynamics of the piece. When the orchestra gets louder, they get louder. And I figured, of course, that they were there for the rehearsal, so they, they know already. But. <laughs> But just the fact that rather than try and tune them out, to go to Ravinia and listen to them as part of the whole experience is much better than thinking, God, I wish they'd do something like cut down those trees so we didn't have this interruption. No, it's not an interruption. It's part of nature. They're out in nature, and that's the way it's supposed to be. Now, warbler migration 
is going to start end of April, beginning of May. And these birds are coming from South America, Central America, and they're going north to the boreal forest in Canada. Some, some of them stick around here and breed, but primarily what they're doing is they, they stop in Chicago, envision you're flying over, and you've been flying all night, and you're hungry, and you're tired, and you see a patch of green, and you're following the lakefront, and bam, there you are. Now, I am a little concerned because I probably took this picture in Daily Bicentennial Plaza, and they're tearing it up right now, and it's going to be two years before Maggie Daly Plaza is finished. So I don't know where all those birds are going to go. Some of them will go to Millennium Park. Probably a lot of them will keep going down to Jackson Park. Any of you who live close to Montrose, that is, Montrose Point is called the Magic Hedge for, for a very good reason, because that's a place where a lot of these birds go. Anyway, this is a bay-breasted warbler. This is a Canada warbler. Who does not sing, oh sweet Canada, Canada? This is a hooded warbler in Millennium. And this American Red Star was at 155 North Wacker. Frank? They built a little park next to this new building. And this is a, a little stopover for migrants. And I discovered this on my way to work. And this bird was so cooperative. This was in the fall. He was on his way back. But I would go there every morning and kind of look for him. And I think he got used to me. And I don't, I don't know what's going on, because birds are always aware. They're super aware of you. I mean, don't ever think that you're looking at a bird and it doesn't see you. Or if you're looking for a bird that it doesn't know you're there, that bird has, has you spotted bef before you even yeah. think. I mean, when you hear a bird call, that bird already knew you were around. But I don't know if it's because they see their reflection in the lens or if it's because they feel my admiration for them through the camera or what, whatever it is, but every once in a while you get a bird that is just happy to get his picture taken. And this, 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 what's going on with this guy? Here's a scarlet tanager in Grant Park. This was taken in, in Daily Bicentennial last year. These are brown thrashers, and they're in Millennium Park. And I can't leave DuPage County out because I do, do a lot of birding there. So here's a tree swallow. They're very common. These trumpeter swans are at Brookfield Zoo, and they're not captive. They're, there's a little water feature behind the uh, wilderness, the wild, let's see, what is it? The wilderness area, they call it, with, with the, uh, the wolves and, and the bears, I think, are back there. And it runs pretty close to the Salt Creek. And they've got this water area there, and they do get wild birds. And these birds are basically wild, but they they like it at Brookfield too. So can blame them. Here's a green heron from Fuller's Book Woods, and here's a great blue heron and the same green heron. And there's a great blue heron. He got the prize. They were both fishing, but the great blue got what he was looking for. <laughs> now we're going to Australia. I got into taking pictures of birds when I started traveling uh, to other countries. I've been to, I think, six countries so far. And I'm not going to throw them all in here. I just decided Let's see what, what was going on in Australia, and I, I put a few pictures in here. This is a brown cuckoo dove, a brush turkey. There's a 
little bed and breakfast called Cassowary House, and they have cassowaries on the ground. And cassowaries, the dads raise the chicks. I don't know where the females go after they lay the eggs, but the dads are in charge of everything. And of course they take handouts from the guests, and this cassowary was taking the food from the chick. This is a crimson finch. It's a little bird probably about this big. a double barred finch and in the cage bird trade they're called owl finches. And of course an emu with a chick. This is not a bird. <laughs> but I couldn't resist. <laughs> this is a flying fox hanging upside down. And there's three of them flying. Galahs, which are parrots. A laughing kookaburra. I almost put a sound clip in here and then I figured, no, I can't do that to you. <laughs> You've probably heard them before. A scaly-breasted lorikeet. Australia is a wonderful place to take pictures of birds because they're just hanging out all over the place, especially the parrot species. And this is a silver gull. For those of you who think that all gulls are the same, they're not. You might notice his very red beak and his very red legs, and he's even got red around his eye. Well, we're back to crows. Birds are incredible mind readers. I figured this out long before I got birds inside, but I, I now, to continue playing music, I guess, I went along with the woman downstairs before I moved out of the apartment who said, I know you like birds. I have a friend who's got two budgies. Would you like to take them? She just got two dogs, and she can't keep them anymore. You'd be their third owner. And I'm thinking, I don't like caged birds. I'm playing for wild birds. She said, oh, but they fly around and go back to the cage. Their wings haven't been clipped. I didn't even know that they did this to birds, that they clipped their wings. So, of course, I took them in. And then, when I had to find a place to live when the building was sold, I had to find a place for my birds. They, they adopted me. Within two days, it's like, how did I ever live without these creatures? Before that, I was living alone, and at first, for about a day or two, I felt like there are other, other creatures in this apartment. And then I started to take care of them, and they just became part of my life. So I moved into a house, and now we're on the first floor, and there's no place for them to watch the birds outside, I can't play for the birds outside, what am I going to do? I got them some finches to keep them company, and they weren't too happy about that, especially when the finches started reproducing. So, to make a long story short, for a long time I had a lot of birds, and uh, one of the, the male budgie died and I got the female a boyfriend and she reproduced and yeah it was it was a lot of birds but uh, and I still have uh, I think I've got 16 birds left I have three finch species and uh, about five buddies left and they're really getting old I don't know though now how I could ever live without them if you had ever told me years ago that I was going to be a bird owner when I didn't even know anything about birds I didn't grow up on a farm, I, I didn't know, I wasn't paying attention to birds at all. I would have said, you're totally insane. But now, I don't know, this is a big part of my life. So, back to the crow. When the crows had West Nile virus, they all, all but a few disappeared. And I had just started finding them in Grant Park. 
and I felt terribly sorry for them. So I was looking for them, and they were not paying any attention to me. But after a while, when they saw me feeding the other birds, they decided, all right, maybe she could be trusted. So they have trained me to feed no one but them. Who is the smarter species? <laughs> the crows are much smarter than I am. And they know, if, I, if I'm walking through the park and they see me, and I'm thinking, all right, I'm going to go put stuff at that tree. They fly right to that tree. They read my mind. The birds at home read my mind. Even the wild birds that I've never had anything to do with, I think they, they communicate this way. And I think that we probably were able to do this a long, long time ago, a lot more before we got technology to do everything for us. And all those coincidences when you're thinking about a friend and they send you an email or they call you or whatnot, there's, there's something going on there. And we should pay more attention to, to that sort of thing more closely than just assuming that we can do everything with technology. So anyway, these are my crows and they're my best my best uh, models, really. And that's the end of the pictures. So I have here a little, a little handout, which you can go. I was supposed to go into what's happening with birds and why birds are important. I'm going to read just a little off of here. I got kind of lucky, except that I'm terribly unorganized, in that Audubon just came out with this month's issue, which was perfect timing for my talk. And of course they're preaching to the choir because this is written for people who are already into nature and birds. But it's a wonderful issue. And some of the things that they raise is that, well, why, why birds matter? Birds are beautiful, they fly, they sing, they're intelligent, I've told you that. They inspire us to create art and music. They've inspired us to dance as well as aspire to the physics of flight. Pay attention to birds and you will bring beauty and meaning into your life. That's, that's from me, in a way. There are most easily observed creatures in the wild. I mean, you can go out looking for deer around here and you might run into one, but huh. basically you can, you can see birds just about anywhere. And when you start paying attention to birds, you, you pay attention to a lot of other things too. And I think that if I had not discovered birds, I'd not be as passionate about the environment and what we're doing to it and what, and what we absolutely have to do to save birds and ourselves if, if I was not involved with them because I care. I care about the people who've been birding for far longer than I have, 30, 40 years, and they have seen declines in species. I don't, I don't know how they can stand it. And when somebody tells me that I'm not going to see that goldfinch that was on the first slide, that pretty soon I'm not going to see them anymore, but that other species are moving up to, quote, replace them, that, that pains me. But we have to do something for the birds in order to save ourselves. And I don't know that I really <laughs> can say too much more, and we can probably cover it in question and answer. So, yes. Oh, what's the lens you using? Thank you. This is my first presentation. The lens that I use on my camera. Um, I primarily, uh, I've got the, it's a Canon 100 to 400 millimeter Ooh, lens. But I, but I also have the 70, I think it's 75 or 70 to 300 millimeter. Yeah, uh, I soon discovered that I was going to need 
a large lens because you can't possibly get close enough to a bird to get any, any detail. Most of the crow shots are, are with the smaller lens, but they let me get close. Yeah? How did you get so close? How did you, you had to be really close to get those shots. How did you do that? Well, yeah, downtown, it, it is possible to get very close to these, these birds that are coming through. They're, they're tired, they're hungry, they, they deal with it. It's like, people are walking through the park, so what? We're hungry, we're, we're here. And, and it, it's not that, that with everything. I mean, sometimes you'll, you'll be chasing something and it knows it and it, it just keeps eluding you. But, but often, uh, if, you, if you're just, you have to kind of plant yourself and watch for movement and just stand there and kind of become part of the part of the scenery and eventually the bird will come out sometimes they're sometimes they're as curious about you as, as you are about them I mean I've had magnolia warblers just kind of like look at me like you're taking my picture are you really you know I mean it's, <laughs> Uh, just this past week, uh, there have been common red poles right, right in front of the Chicago Yacht Club. Early in the morning, I, I get up maybe once a week at four o'clock so I can get downtown an hour before I have to go into work and I go down to the lakefront just to see who's arriving, what's going on, and to feed the crows, of course. As long as I feed the crows, they'll be my friends. Uh, but anyway, yeah, so these common red poles have been hanging out, and and I didn't even realize uh, it was it was yesterday. Yesterday morning, I got up early and went down, and I thought, oh, they're probably gone. And I heard some little noises, and I thought maybe they were house sparrows. And then they flew up into the tree, and there they were, common red poles. There, so I took some more pictures of them. I didn't bring those pictures. Yes. Okay. In, in your thing with crows, do you find more of a congregation of crows near uh, City Hall and the ballparks <laughs> rather than the uh, general downtown area where business is going? Or do you see crows more congregating around some of the more business centers in the city? Well, I think crows are going to go wherever there's a good food supply. And actually, uh, right now, some of you may have noticed that you're seeing a lot more gulls than you have in, in the last. They're coming. They're coming for the taste of Chicago. They're also, <laughs> they're also coming to breed. But uh, I, even before I got interested in in birds, I can remember when I was a musician on the road. I think, yeah, I was. I was seeing. Uh, Oh, gulls inland, and I'm thinking, what's going on? Aren't, aren't they seabirds? And I think with parking lots and fast food joints, this is when the gulls started moving in. And so they, it's, it's their regular uh, routine now. And a lot of the gulls that you see in the suburbs will go back to the lakefront at night. You can just kind of see them coming in early in the morning to go to work and then going back home. <laughs> <laughs> but they don't have to deal with traffic, do they? What? They don't have to deal with traffic, do they? No. Generally, usually not, unless somebody drops something on the, on the street. As a quick follow-up question, where's a good place to eat crow around here? <laughs> Sad, I don't know. But I didn't really answer your question either, did I? About the crows, no. Yeah. Okay. I, I only know the crows that are in the loop, and they they all know me. A good place to eat crow, Tim, right after you get an extra butted. Oh. I saw a lot of crows. Cypress. She got somebody. It was a heavy rain, and all the earth was kind of up out of the ground. There must have been three or four hundred crows out there. Okay, well, if birds are 
opportunists, and, and if there's a if there's a good remember when the uh, the big cicada the cicadas what was it the 18 year or whatever they were yeah yeah when they were everywhere that was a feast for birds you had gulls catching them in the air you had a lot of birds that you wouldn't think of uh, bothering with them where everybody was trying to eat them. And uh, birds are very helpful to farmers that way when, when uh, their crops get inundated with, with things that they shouldn't or they don't want to have. I'm sorry, okay. Yeah, I just want to share with you something. Uh, I uh, worked for a couple of years at the UPS uh, district in uh, downtown uh, uh, inner city Chicago, 14th, 14th Street in Jefferson. It's one big, long, flat roof building, and you had uh, seagulls uh, nesting there. And I figured uh, they do that because it resembles a beach. Big, wide expanse, no cover, they can see predators coming. And they had a lot of chicks, uh, sometimes, chicks would sometimes fall off and die. And sometimes chicks uh, get to the point where they're fledglings and they flutter down to the street. And some of them get run over by cars, okay? Some of them die that way. But then uh, one day I saw a chick walking, trying to cross the street, walk across the street, and there was a lot of traffic. The bird turned around, hopped back on the sidewalk, turned around to look at traffic, waited till the traffic stopped, then walked across the street. That's amazing. That's one smart bird. Yeah, it, birds are, well, you know, you, you think of birds as being, just, they move in flocks and they just do what all the other birds are doing and, and actually uh, scientists are studying that now because they, they want to know what's going on, how, how do they possibly communicate and how they're, they're going to see if that can help them with crowd control of people. Most of the time birds are on their own and they're very independent and, and they, they have their basic set of skills but they make a lot of decisions by themselves. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, when you were really studying birds, why didn't you get with some ornithologists that uh, had a lot of time on their hands to study birds? Uh, two that come to mind would be uh, uh, the bird man of Alcatraz and uh, uh, Leopold. And they had a lot of time to study birds. Yeah, and you might have seen some information from those guys. They're already dead. Dead. They're dead. Yes, well. <laughs> Yeah, there's, there are things that I'm, I'm, I'm constantly learning from things I read and from observation is probably the, the biggest thing. Um, I just want to uh, share some things that happened to me. I was uh, working at the time and I was eating my lunch on the lake uh, shore near my job. And a um, piece of my, big piece of my sandwich fell on the ground. And before I knew it, there was a seagull who was trying to approach me and pick it up. I had, so I, I was, I did not want to move to scare it, and I had a red dress, and the red dress was the only thing moving, flopping in the wind, you know. So I was still, and the seagull was really worrying about this red dress. Mm -hmm. And, um, and before, so we were kind of looking at each other, I was not moving, and she was scared, obviously, and she was feeling cool. Before I knew it, there was another seagull who came straight down, grabbed a big piece of bread, and flew a couple, you know, a mm -hmm. few feet uh, further. And I said, oh, wow. And so this seagull just flew out, and before I knew it, she was coming back, with five or six other big ones, okay. and they were all screaming and squawking mm -hmm. at these uh, birds that stole, and you could see with the quacking and how angry they were. And I was like, <laughs> astounded, you know? I'm like, wow, the entire family is ganging. <laughs> they, and I, I, always I used to feed that. girls for a it's short amazing. period of time, and they, they do this. Yeah, yeah. They, it's like, yeah. they breathe. Yeah, right, yeah. right. And, and I, I used to be able to get them to be quiet. 
Well, I understood that. Well, anger. yeah, so no, just, but I, just I mean, I just I tried this. I tried this, knowing that they they read my mind. So she, I just, yeah, she yeah. complained to her family yeah. when they came back. Yeah, <laughs> that was amazing. <laughs> Richard, then uh, Joe, and then uh, Linda. Linda. Uh, parrots and parakeets are known to talk. Do they also sing? Um, they whistle. <laughs> yeah, they whistle. It's not really. They they're more. It's more of a talking thing. I, actually, I have my budgies. I call it budgie rap because uh -huh. it's got a lot of ch -ch 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 in it. But they, but they sing too. I've, I, I've seen them practicing what, what they believe is a song, and it really, uh, in terms of new music and whatnot, I mean, it, it is, it is musical, you know. But, but not, not so much to our ears. It's not considered a song. It's more a way that they communicate. But they, but they do, actually sing when, when they're, when they're trying to woo each other. Uh, another thing, um, am I correct in thinking that there are gender differences, that uh, uh, males and females make different sounds, and, and can you, do they sing differently? Uh, generally, yeah, males and females uh, make somewhat different sounds. The call, the call notes are probably the same. Generally, the males are the ones who sing. However, uh, for instance, the cardinals, uh, the females do sing. I've never. <laughs> no, not that kind. But uh, the northern cardinals, uh, the females do sing. There are not too many species where the females sing, though. It's mostly the guys. In the Chicago area, are there species of birds that are predatory on other species of birds? Or do they fight over food supplies? Uh, well, you've got your predators. I mean, you've got peregrine falcons, you have red-tailed hawks, you have cooper's hawks in, the, in all the neighborhoods. And they prey on birds and small mammals and whatever they can get. Uh, Check on hawks. As far as competing for food goes, sometimes size matters. Like the larger birds will, will win out. Although, when I was feeding God forbid, I was feeding house sparrows and pigeons for a while. The house sparrows are small enough to go right under the beak of a pigeon and steal something. So it all depends on, on who's, who's doing what. <laughs> Tell us, for informational purpose, uh, purposes, what your opinion is of the good deed that we do when we throw out our old stale bread to the birds. Uh, old stale bread to birds is not a good idea. It's Fresh bread. Even white bread is bad for birds. I used to, I used to make bread from. I, I started going through my pantry because I had all these grains that were sitting there, whole grains, and I, I came up with some wonderful recipes and they were like solid solid bread. That, that I would feed the birds, but basically it's, it's not good for them. It's not they're a, a good food source now. Having said that, uh, a lot of people who want to see gulls uh, every once, once, once a year, way up in Winthrop Harbor, bunch of birders get together and they have a gull frolic and they go there with Wonder Bread and they throw it out just because they want to get the gulls to come in and they want to see it. You know, you know. Gulls are basically used to eating garbage anyway, so I guess it's not too bad. But, but, uh, you say the gulls are gullible? <laughs> yes, they are very gullible. The gulls are gullible. That's the reason why we get so many Yeah, Lisa, is there evidence? Online birds that if the predator comes around, such as my cat Halston, <laughs> that one of them will sound an alarm. Oh, is it 
Because they're all truistic behavior among birds, basically. Um, I observe a lot of altruistic behavior in my house. I don't know how much there is. Although, no, I, I, I think among certain species there, there definitely is. But yeah, birds will, warning calls, uh, whoever sees the predator first lets everybody know. And I suppose you could say that's <coughs> altruistic. They have a distress call or something? Oh yeah. Every, and they, they may differ between species, but it's interesting how everybody understands everybody else's distress call. Huh. Okay. Did you share, excuse me, did you share any of your observations with the ornithology lab at Cornell University? Um, no, not, not yet. I, Basically, I, I've been doing this for a long time, and I, and I think they might even be more interested in what's going on with my zebra finches at home than, than the uh, wild bird stuff. But, uh, I, well, I, I wrote down Kruzma, and he's affiliated with Cornell, and he's, he's really big on bird song, but he couldn't hear them. He said, I'm not a musician, so I can't tell, you know, that sort of thing. So it, it's something I would like to do, but I don't have an awful lot of time for this. Unfortunately, I'm still working, and I'm working harder than ever. But I did start, I have a blog, and I figured, well, I can, I can put stuff up on there, and maybe somebody will notice it, you know, someday, maybe. I would love it. I would love it if somebody wanted to test my observation. If somebody cared enough to, because you know, they do everything with, with um, uh, these sonograms, you know. So they could have sonograms of music and sonograms of birds, and they could ought to be able to figure out that, yeah, it's on the same frequency. I, I would love it if they, would, if they would do that. I don't want the credit for it. I don't. Yeah, number two, I have my cat Felix. You can watch the birds all he wanted, but he wasn't allowed out of the house. That's good. He can stay. He can watch all the window all he wanted. Yeah. Okay. Seven things you can do for birds. One of the, the last one on this list is curb your cats. What? What is your opinion of cats and birds? <laughs> My opinion of cats and birds. Well, they are enemies. Uh, you probably know about the study that they did recently where they put <laughs> video cams or whatnot on, on cats to see who they were killing and they came up with a lot more killing than they thought even existed. So in addition to everything, I mean the, the biggest, the biggest uh, problem that birds theoretically have, at least grassland birds, they thought it was habitat loss. And now I just read a study uh, about a study in Canada, I think it was last week, where they've discovered that pesticides are, even, are doing the birds in even worse than habitat loss. I mean, it's like the phenomenal, I don't know what the statistic is, but if a bird produces 10, let's say it has two clutches and, and 10 offspring, they may be lucky if one or two survive. That's pretty awful. That's awful odds. It's not that like that with every species, but a lot of the, a lot of the species that that we don't see a lot of is the reason why, is because we've crowded them out. They don't have any place to to raise a family. They don't have any food. I mean, and then and then you've got predators that weren't there before. It, it, you, We've got uh, places like Hawaii that never had cats and rats and, and everything else that we brought over there. And, and I forget, I think 67% or something of, of their native species are, are extinct. Some people think pigeons are rats with wings. How do you feel about them? Oh, I knew, I knew this was coming. <laughs> can, can pigeons sing? Uh, pigeons, cool. They, they dance. They're better dancers than they are singers. 
And I did have, when I first moved in to my house, I did have a pair of pigeons nesting right on my front porch. I, I put some bricks there so that wouldn't happen again, but I could hear their offspring singing along with the music I was playing, and they were begging in key. So they're musical. Uh, the thing about pigeons is... Yeah, sure. The thing about pigeons is that we have created the perfect habitat for them. All these buildings, they're rock pigeons. They, you know, Cliffs of Dover, think of whatever, you know, wherever they started. Any, any building that has a ledge is a potential nest for a pigeon. And they've been with humanity for so long they're well adapted to us. I cannot believe the pigeons downtown that actually forage in the street. They're not afraid of cars. Obviously, they get run over sometimes, but they are so used to us. that These are the birds that we're going to be left with if all the other birds are gone. So, you know, I mean, and they're, they're incredibly intelligent, though. They, they've done studies. There was a study that somebody did with art students and pigeons. I forget exactly how it goes, but the pigeons were better at, at discerning between Matisse and Picasso than the art students. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I do have a question. I don't know if you can answer this or not, but I come from a family who has been seeding birds. I grew up with that. Okay. 50 years. I've watched my mother and my father, and I, there's not a day, and Robert can verify that, there's not a day that goes by that I don't feed the bird. Here's my question. Can I really get arrested for this? Hasn't there been a law that's been passed? Only pigeons. Just the pigeons? Pigeons, yeah. How do you discriminate? I know, I know. I park and I lay out some bread. Oh boy, a pigeon comes down this way, a little bird's come down this Yeah, down. yeah, I know. Is it really just like a, like a jaywalking kind of a penalty where it's not strictly enforced? I don't know. I don't know. They they put up these signs. It up, doesn't stop you, does it? Well, no. no but 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 when I but when I'm in Grant Park or Millennium Park, and like I, I have been I have been feeling feeding the white throated sparrows that were hanging out at the northwest end of Millennium, and then the house sparrows found out about it, and then of course the pigeons found out about it. Well, by the time the pigeons get there, I'm gone. They're just doing the cleanup crew thing, you know. I mean, you can't. Yeah, you can't. No. Life is life, right? You're safe. You're safe. <laughs> no, but I, I think it's but, kind but, of sad. but just be careful, because for instance, I used I used to feed. I think it's sad. I used to feed gulls, and and, and there there was waterfowl too in, in the uh, river. I used to feed them. I'd get off the train, and I loved to watch the gulls catch I stuff, I but. Right after 9-11, that was no longer allowed. I could be a terrorist. Yeah, so, you know. But, yeah. now, but now, but now they let, but now you can, you can smoke there. You can, you can try and just walk through there. You can barely breathe. The, the smokers are there and, and the plantings and the trees are dying. But, you know, that's okay. Yeah, right. That's so, okay, right. Exactly. Whatever. Bob? Oh, I was wondering, uh, do you think that person for Oh, absolutely. Okay, all right. Actually, I wanted to get around to this. I'm so late. I'm, I'm definitely sure that birds sing because they can and because they, they want to and because they love to. They also sing because it's part of their makeup. I mean, when my zebra finch guys, I used to love watching them start to grow and start to work on their songs because they, they would start out with this little <laughs> nothing that made, made much sense but they would they would work on it and work on it and work on it and months later they finally produced a song and they go around the house they're not always chasing somebody it's kind of like okay I'm here now let me sing uh, I and and I I've heard birds like sing in in echo chambers like between buildings. I know that they like that sound because it just reverberates. I'm sure that they sing because they want to. It takes too much effort to produce a song.
to be doing it just for sex. <laughs> uh, don't be sure of that. <laughs> well, I thought, you know. <laughs> Uh, oh well, uh, suddenly, suddenly anybody who was doing anything not mainstream after 9/11, yeah. And at the beginning yeah. of the spring, you hear them too. It, it didn't bother. All I know is it didn't bother them before 9/11. But after 9/11, all the maintenance crews certain, suddenly became security guards. You know, and they were out there just making sure that people get off the train and they walk and keep going and don't stop. So what, you're planting bombs on the birds? <laughs> I don't know. I, I, yeah, it's a good I just... idea. <laughs> I, ravens are not here, unfortunately. They're farther north. They're, they're corbids, they are related to crows, and they're, they are also out west. They tend to stay away from people, so that, that gives me a sense right there that they are smart, the smartest birds. <laughs> they're, they're bigger than, yeah. Oh, no, not quite, but they are, they are larger. Do birds respond to human singing, for example, uh, opera singing? Yeah, I think so. I actually, they respond more to live performance than anything else. Because I play, WFMT is playing for those birds all day long and all night, and they're every once in a while, and and a, a lot of times. They'll do kind of like a double take if, if they're playing something that I play. They'll kind of like, well, she's not sitting there. But, so they're cognizant of, of what's going on. But basically, their reaction to canned music is not as strong as live performance. And, uh, but every once in a while, a bird will hear something on the radio that reminds it of its own song, and it'll chime right in. Hi. Uh, do birds know the difference between Bach and you play, what else do you play besides Mozart? Bach and Mozart? <laughs> they hate, they don't like Messiaen. <laughs> Ravel wasn't bad. Not that I can play Messiaen, but they, generally they don't relate to it. They, they like stuff where they can tell, you know, what's going on. And basically so do I. So, it's, I mean, I mean they're not too crazy about the more modern stuff, but they, they tolerate it. You say rock and roll? Huh. <laughs> they have excellent taste. I'm trying to search in the back of my mind, and there's, I know my notice, what is that Chinese folk tale about the song of the nightingale? Why is that? The Chinese folk tale? Yeah, it was something like a guy had to get the song of the nightingale or something. I don't know. It's a nightingale, it's a singer, right? I do not know. I'm, I'm very ignorant about nightingales. They're... I thought that was what it was. I do know that Beatrice Harrison was a cellist during World War II who got famous on the BBC for recordings of her playing her cello for night nightingales. Then I just read something, I think, well, this morning. That's another thing. Are birds regarded differently in different cultures? Or yes. Ab actually, I corresponded with, with a guy, what's his name? Mm. Uh, they're not real important to us. Uh, in Afghanistan, before the war, of course, I don't think this has gone on since the Taliban and even since we've been there, but the Afghans would bring their caged birds to outdoor concerts so they could sing along. They think that bird song is the song from, from God. Yeah, 
Gotta buy one for the train. That's good to know. I've heard a rumor, maybe you can tell me if it's true or not. Beethoven, when he was complimented on his music, said that he did not create anything, he just listened and heard it. Now, I've heard that the Fifth Symphony, which is the most famous, started out with was actually the sound of a bird in, his, in the woods near his home. Actually, Luis Baptista, the guy who died before I discovered this, was uh, the one who said that he was walking through, he was in South America someplace, he was walking through uh, the rainforest and he heard a bird sing that. Now, I, I think that perhaps Anonymous was a bird. I mean, all those great hits written by Anonymous. <laughs> the birds have been, have been making music longer than we have. I think we imitated a lot from them. I think it's, in, it's uh, some um, uh, areas of China where every day people take their bird out in a cage, just like we take our dog out yeah, and take the dog out. Take the birds it's outside. a dog out. Yeah, it's a bird out. Yeah. <laughs> 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 uh, you know, uh, I grew up in New Jersey and I understood there how cardinals sing. And then when I came to the Midwest, it's a similar but different song. Okay. So I'm, there must be dialects. There, there are dialects, definitely. Definitely. Oh. <laughs> All right. There definitely are dialects. I grew up in central Indiana, and the crows call just like they do down in New Orleans, but there is a dialect difference. I'm going to record that, and I'll bring it up here to meet sometime in central New Orleans. They, they actually they say the same word, call, call but they do sound different. Thank you, Margaret. That's interesting, yeah. I, I'm waiting for fish crows to come. We don't have them yet, but they're coming up from the south. We have them in Ohio for some reason. Uh, and they, their crows, they're smaller than our American crows, and their, their call is like a ah, 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 ah. That sort of thing. Will the arrival of the fish crows, seeing as how a cub fan has to eat so much of it, help get them to win the World Series sometime? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Maybe that's what we've been waiting for. Hey, you got to remove the curse from Billy Goat's eyes. Oh, do you, okay. do you think that this old oh god bird is still... Oh, no. No. Still uh, the last person to weigh in on this was none other than Doug Stotts, who was an ornithologist at the Field Museum, and he said that uh, it definitely does not exist. A couple more practical questions. If a person you wants might to want to explain the okay. question, if they don't know. Oh, the old god bird. It's a bird that hasn't been seen for what? 40? The ivory-billed woodpecker. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. They just could not make a definite ID based on, on the really lousy-looking film that they had. So. If somebody was wanting to get involved in birding in the Chicago area, can you give us a couple of websites and maybe some associations and a Absolutely. Of places to yeah. They're on, they're on this handout and I definitely recommend Chicago Audubon. They have they have bird walks. They used to have them at North Park on every Saturday, but they they haven't been listing them. I just got their their uh, uh, they used to have them newsletter, in the but, but they but they do uh, still have them down at uh, Jackson Park, south of the yeah. shed. Is it? Yeah, and Wednesday and Friday, and oh, and and Chicago Ornithological Society. Jeff Williamson leads walks at North Park, North Pond. I mean Pond. <laughs> and have you ever done any video work with birds? Uh, Only. I have like a like a little video on, on my cameras and just very very little. I have 
I have some videos of crows. And some somewhere I've got a, a YouTube account that I have put up there. Okay, Don, did you have a question? Don? Oh. The birds sing in major and minor keys? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Do you have preferences? Um, I don't think so. Do they sing together? Sometimes. Now, I have an interesting thing. They, they say that morning doves, they're born with their song. It's not taught. And I had the same, probably the same morning dove that, uh, I used to call him Primo, and then he brought his son around, who was Secondo. And I swear, one day, if, if I can find this tape somewhere in my box of a thousand tapes that I have over the years, he was he was coaching him, and they were both singing together with the music. So, yeah. The alleged sighting of the ivory bill in, in Cuba is, is something that cannot be proved. Yeah, I mean, it's it's out there, but yeah, it's, it's not not something that anybody. I I have read over the last two weeks. I think there have been four or five articles related to birds in the New York Times. Just, you know, it's like every day, it's like, oh, now what? Oh, now what? I mean, I think the last thing was that they discovered uh, bones and, or, or, or fossils in China that now indicate that perhaps birds started out with four wings instead of two. This precedes Archaeopteryx. I, you know, it, it's every day there's something new. So if, I, if, I, if anybody confirms that there's a, an ivory build in Cuba, we'll know about it eventually. <laughs> <laughs> I think. Have you ever thought about going on what the ultimate in birding is called the big the year? Big year. <laughs> and can you explain what it is to the audience, okay. please? Um, I, go get the movie. <laughs> uh, the big year is uh, a competitive sort of thing, which, no, I would not do. I am not a competitive birder. I'm barely a lister. I've been to all these countries and I still haven't sat down to figure out how many birds I've seen yet. I want to do it someday, but I do not keep compulsive lists. I do post sightings on eBird because it's, it's good for the people keeping track of how many birds there are and where they're being seen. I try to do that as often as possible, but anyway. Uh, the big year is a competitive thing where anyone who wants to can try and see as many birds in the United States, as many different species as possible within a year. And then they give the award to the person who has seen the most birds. And they, they did a movie on this with Steve Martin and... Uh, Owen Wilson. A couple other people I can't think of. Owen Wilson. I'm sorry, who? Owen Wilson. Owen Wilson, yeah, and and I can't remember the... Jack Black. Jack Black, that's it. Okay, yeah, they did a movie based on a book called The Big Year, which was based on this one guy's experience. So it was a true story, and that was that came out a couple years ago, and I was amazed if anybody saw it who wasn't a birder. But it's now, you, you can get it and you can watch it anytime. Another good movie, though, perhaps more realistic, is uh, this thing that HBO came out with last year. Uh, it's a documentary and it's called Birders, the Central Park Effect. And it's about people who watch birds in Central Park. And it's, a, it's similar to the same kind of birds that we get here. They, they, they show up for migration and they go looking for birds and they've got beautiful fo photos, a lot of beautiful videos, very nice footage, and uh, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty interesting to see what turns up in a big city. Did you like Hitchcock's the birds? I never saw the birds. Well, you know, 
I'm sure that uh, crows were not treated too nicely. <laughs> from what I, uh, but no, I haven't seen it. And I don't, I don't know that I, if there's an innate fear of things flying at you, but I used to have nightmares every once in a while of things buzzing around my head and flying. I don't get that anymore. Early on when the birds were coming toward, toward the window where I was playing and I had food there, when a crow finally decided that he was gonna pick a peanut off the, off the ledge and here's this big bird and he's flying toward me and I'm thinking, well you better get over it now. Yeah. And I've actually got, gotten the crow so they fly very close to me and I have some that are just like their little, their little dogs, they follow me around and I love it. I decided that when I first started feeding birds downtown and the house sparrows were watching me and they'd go zipping right by my ear, I decided this is a greeting, this is not, they're not harassing me. And so far it's proven to be true pretty much. Although I did have a red-winged blackbird last year who annoyed me, not because I was near his nest, which is what they usually do. I was not paying attention to the birds I normally feed because I was looking for migrants, warblers. I wanted to, I, I, would, I was gonna feed them, but first I wanted to get down to what I came to the park for. He kept hitting me in the back of the head. And I turned around and I, I looked at him and I said, you can't do that. I yelled at him. He never did it again. But, <laughs> but he, does, he does know me. And I, just, I saw him, uh, I, I'm pretty sure last week, when I showed up, I was walking through the park and he came and just showed me his little red epaulets and said, hey, remember me? And I, I call him Peanut Face and I, I gave him a peanut. I mean, you know, if he asks nicely, that's fine, but... <laughs> okay. Uh, well, yeah, there, I mean, there's some bird seed mixes that are, that are good for some of the birds, but they, everybody, just about everybody loves peanuts. And the crows can crack their own open, and the smaller birds usually need some help. Charles? Yeah, just the other day I got some literature in the mail from, I think it was Ducks Unlimited. <laughs> um, are you familiar with who they are? Or? It sounds familiar, but I... I mean, there was something years ago I heard, like, they were encouraging even the eco people to buy duck, duck stamps. stamps. Yeah, okay. That's yeah. What I, yeah. You know, I think that's why I got it. Mm -hmm. I bought a duck Somebody. stamp uh, at a conference a couple years ago. It's, it's one way to preserve habitat. I mean, sure, there are people who are killing these birds, but if they're not there for them to kill, so. Hunters support a lot of a lot of the. Uh, are there any locations habitat. where you guys are up in arms uh, to protect the uh, like migratory spots or something like that? that well, Mark might come in and. You know. The the latest thing I've heard about is uh, how they're going to expand. The, uh, uh, the Charter One Pavilion at uh, Northerly, Island. Northerly Island, yeah, yeah, and this was supposed to be a preserve for birds, and now they, and now they, I guess they want to turn it into a Chicago Ravinia, and uh, the Chicago Ornithological Society is not too happy about this. I, there's always. There's always this. I mean, frankly, uh, birders, I think, breathed a sigh of relief when we didn't get the Olympics because 
of what they were going to do to migratory habitat by building things and whatnot. So, yeah. I heard something about 15 years ago. It was a Galveston Island right off the coast of uh, Texas in the Gulf of Mexico, about 15 miles out. And there was a woman sitting there at McDonald's, and she was fussing about people feeding the seagulls. She claimed that the last year she had a McDonald's quarter pounder. She'd taken one bite out of it, holding like this. The seagull flew over her shoulder and grabbed it and took off with it. She didn't even feel it. She felt the breeze, she didn't, he didn't touch it once with his wing. And I was kind of skeptical. Could that happen? Um, probably, yeah. I mean, the, the more they get used to us. It took the whole quarter pounder. Is that pretty heavy yeah. if they that size? Uh, a gull will find a way. We want more of these around. Yeah. <laughs> that makes life real cool. You want to try 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 <laughs> I didn't know whether to believe it or not. She sounded sincere. Wow, okay. that's a whopper. <laughs> Maybe it's time we go to we go to rebuttals uh, soon. Yes. I think we will start rebutting. I see that. Uh, All right. Let's thank our speaker again. And why is it there's so many bird brains on the road? <laughs> Very poetic, too. Bird from the rest of us. Uh, you've got a few ideas. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven. Only Did you get me? No, you've got two more back there. Yeah, two more back there already. Well, some of you might be inspired. Did you get me, Brom? Tim, you'll keep time. Uh, yeah. If I get my cell I'll keep time, but I have to go get my cell phone from the vehicle. Oh, so yeah. I'll be back to get it. So All just right. keep time for the first five person. Right. What are you going to do, five? Francisco. Five minutes, Frank? How, how long, how long, Brom? I mean, five. five minutes, okay. Yeah. Be back in a I have a, a few experiences with birds because I travel a lot. I was in the jungles in the upper Amazon in Brazil. I was in the Galapagos Islands. I was in Australia, uh, in uh, South China Sea, in the Philippines, and uh, and of course in Buenos Aires. In a, what's happening? Uh, so when when we got married, we went to a, a, our honeymoon into the southern part of Argentina, where the uh, uh, Magellan penguins uh, nest in there. About a million of them nests there are in, in that area, and uh, it was very very funny because they they go to the water to feed and then they come back so they go there are so many that they go one after the other and so when we the tourists was going to cross their path they stop and they let us pass and then when we all the group passed then they continue and it was like it was slides in there because it's very very regularly they, they, they avoid by that um, also, in the Galapagos, the, the animals, but the birds especially, they are not fearful of men. So you can pick up with your hands an albatross in his nest, and he will not, will not react. You pick him up, and you put it back, and he, he, he's uh, So lucky for them that we have not been there, but unlucky for them because since we have coming back in there, we brought all kinds of shit. Uh, including plastic shit uh, that the birds die with from 
and uh, also we brought cats and rats and so on. So it's a it's a massacre. Um, also, I, I was hoping that we can. Hey, it bothers when somebody's talking and somebody's going on and on and on and on. You know, it's all with the same story. God damn it. Uh, when uh, there was a period after the Chernobyl accident that there were species of birds that they were being decimated. But the funny thing was that some birds were decimated and others weren't in the same area and they couldn't figure what it was until they realized that the birds that pick up the seeds from the ground they were picking up the radiation and then they were not procreating. So we, for several years in the United States, we have a decline of several species of birds because of the Chernobyl accident. I don't know how this new accident will be affecting the, the birds and other species of animals in the, um, the most beautiful sound that you can expect to hear in the bird kingdom is the doves in the forest. They coo and coo and coo with the, it's, it's, it's very, very beautiful. It's not a song as, as a continuous, uh, several different notes, but it's a very, very sweet and, um, and, and profound sound. Uh, the, the most powerful sound in the animal kingdom is by an animal that is about an inch and a quarter long. It's called the coqui in, in Puerto Rico. Uh, it makes a sound that is louder than a, uh, that a, one of the engines on a rocket uh, airplane. They make, they make a sound like, sound like and that is so powerful that it will, will uh, damage your ears if you hear it often enough. Um, in the Amazon, where all these trees and all that, I hear hundreds of different songs. I never saw a bird there. It's so dense that they are up there and they, you, you didn't see it. Uh, so I don't have pictures of the birds in the Amazon. I have pictures of the birds in Australia and in the Galapagos, of course. Um, so we, we really need to, to confront the reality that we are really destroying this world. And uh, whether it is chemicals that we are using to, uh, to fight pesticides to use to, uh, you know, for plantations and so on, but also the noise that we make affect the birds mating and so on. And other animals, including the frogs, they get disrupted by all the noise that we make. Uh, but the, the thing that you all heard me say is that we throw 4,500 tons of plastic shit into the sea every day and millions or billions of birds are dying because of that. <coughs> and fish too. Last April, uh, I joined a group of birders in the southeast area of Chicago along I-94, where the old shipping area was. Uh, they had discovered a community of eagle nests in this very swampy area. There were no uh, leaves on the trees yet, but the, uh, the big community must have been maybe six or seven nests in the area. And uh, one of the members had a, a parabolic microphone so he could hear uh, the communication between the eagles, the adult eagles and the, uh, the small fledglings. And they were pretty big fledglings, so. Yeah, but that was good. On the issue of blackbirds, uh, while I was going to college, I worked on the railroad uh, in, in the southwest side of Chicago, where there was a, a huge railroad yard that ran for three miles, and lots of swampy areas. 
and I was walking along, uh, checking one of the trains, and uh, uh, one of my co-workers on another crew uh, came holding his neck, and he had gone too close to a uh, blackbird nest, I presume, and the blackbird drove, dove directly into his neck, beak first, put a big hole in his neck, and the bird died, of course. But uh, they, they go to long extremes. Um, there's a subspecies of, of, of the uh, bobolink uh, that uh, I call the Janis Joplin bobolink because I heard it sing once, uh, me and my bobolink McGee. <laughs> I'm Mike Foley. I just want to say to Ms. Rest, I'm glad I heard this lecture. It was thoroughly delightful. It was one of the most pleasant lectures I've ever heard here. And I really enjoyed it. I'm glad I'm here. Thank you. A lot has been said and taught about the uh, role of bees, the pollination plant life. And this talk tonight reminded me of something that happened in 1965, I was 25 years old. They were putting the interstate, they were completing it, and behind my house I had a couple of acres just north of Indianapolis. They had taken out some big trees and they left some big holes that were maybe four or five feet across and I don't know how deep. And I saw some little fish in there and you could see through them. You could see their intestines and their little parts inside. And I wondered where they came from. I did a little research and it seemed like birds, when they drink water, they suck up these little microscopic fish eggs and then when they eliminate them, a bird has a, a very simple uh, Elimination system, a lot simpler than ours. Those eggs hatch, and they've got the bird manure as a fertilizer. And so they not only propagate the fish life, but I mean, I never thought much about it until tonight, but I think birds do a lot more than what we usually think of. I think this ought to be looked into more by scientists. I mean, sure, bees are important and they're disappearing, but I don't think we're, I think we're underestimating the role of uh, birds. Good evening. Uh, I have several things I'd like to mention. One is that uh, when I was a young boy, uh, the teacher was uh, uh, giving a lesson about the uh, when the pilgrims came. And uh, many of you may not know this, but the uh, Mayflower was a, uh, a ship that came periodically. It didn't just come once. And uh, the reason I mention this is because that the teacher mentioned that there was a group of uh, people that came and if one of the men, uh, I didn't pay as close of attention as I should have, so I can't give you a name, but when he left England, he brought with him a box with holes punched in it that was filled with sparrows. And when he got off the ship, he opened up the box and let the sparrows go. Prior to that, there were no sparrows in America. So every sparrow you see is descended from that box that that man brought. And he brought that to make him feel more at home, like when he was in England. Uh, another thing I'd like to mention here is that uh, I was way out west one day, about an hour from Chicago, and uh, I saw a flock of birds. It was late in the autumn, but the weather was still nice. And I saw a flock of birds flying, and they were in an, a rather weird formation. And I thought, my, I wonder what that's all about. 
I kept driving, and then I saw another flock of birds, and they were in another formation. And uh, I began to wonder, perhaps they're trying to tell us something. Maybe they're giving us a weather report or a weather prediction or God knows what, but there must be a reason why the birds fly in formations. So I think we can learn a lot of things from birds, uh, and um, that's all there is to it. Uh, other than that, that's really all I want to say with respect to birds. I hope I've been helpful in that way. Uh, but I would also like to say that uh, I think that everyone here ought to ask for their money back because there are certain people who come here and don't pay. That haven't paid tonight and they don't do anything about it. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. First of all, the subject of the Corvidae came up, the family that crows belong to. That also includes the ravens, magpies, uh, and it also includes every species of jay, not just blue jays. And they're among the smartest of all the birds. And that's why you also see more crows around here than you did 30 or 40 years ago, because apparently the crows figured out if they stayed predominantly in rural areas, the farmers would shoot them. And as a result, they decided to go where the living is a little easier in the, in the parks and the suburbs. And secondly, as I pointed out earlier to my good friend Tim Bulger, where can he go to eat crow? Well, let him wait until the next time somebody comes up here to our body. Thank you. <laughs> Cypress right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to think of things I, I know about birds, and there's there's really not a whole lot, but I rely on my friend Lisa to impart all of her um, wisdom and observation about birds. Um, I, I will tell a story, uh, a short story about being in Rome with my husband Ed. And I believe we were on the Spanish steps, and well, someplace neat in Rome. And we saw this phenomenon, which is called a murmuration. Um, and Lisa pointed out it, it only starlings do it, but it's this kind of ghostly, um, amorphous shape. And, game of tag or what, I don't know why the birds do it, but I, I really was so taken by it and it seemed like like the Holy Spirit or something, but um, that is my probably my one most grand bird story. I just really wanted to get up here and thank our friend Lisa for coming and I too thought her speech was delightful. Um, and here on her business card, which there are a few up here, um, if you want to follow her and her lovely, gorgeous photos of birds and different countries that she's going to, she does have this blog, which is kind of grayed out here under gold bird, bird variations, but it's musicbirdblog.com if you want to keep in touch with Lisa or have questions or concerns about birds. But thank you. Oh, my. Okay, I'm going to tell you guys a little something about a secret. It's not my favorite dish in the world, but I happen to eat a lot of crow. You know, a crow is a, is a smart bird, so you'd think I'd uh, learn a little bit something by now. You know, being a Cub fan, and to you guys being a capitalist, and all this stuff. And I was just pointed out just recently that... Uh, I had a little dessert of crow already with what's going on in Cyprus now. Who knows how much crow I'm going to have to eat for a while. But do you guys realize the amount of varieties of, of crow dishes there are? And especially how, how sometimes you can serve it up? For example, if you're on a Sunday, Sunday afternoon and watching a sporting event and you're 
significant other wants to do something, you say no, and you're going to get this dirty look and all this stuff, that's called honeydew crow. <laughs> we can also say, uh, we can also say, for example, when you're at a job or, or something else, you can also have a, well, anyway, I could go on and on about crows, but uh, our infamous crow magnet host, Charlie. <laughs> Not to mention crispy crow kebabs that could be put on the menu here. You know, I've often wondered why Las Vegas doesn't have a restaurant called Crows. Lose a bet? Eat at Crows. We have the most we have the best crow around. And you might even even get a little taste of Vegas. You know, perhaps maybe it might even be better in front of the uh, political establishment here in downtown when these politicians literally have to go eat crow. Just imagine the franchise possibilities of it. Yes, we could learn a lot from birds, particularly crows. I mean, look at us now. We got a whole species of them called cub fans on the north side. They must love their crow. Thank you. Okay, um, just, just thinking about this, um, the birds really have, uh, well, we live with birds, so they're, they're a part of our lives and a part of our stories and our myths and, and songs, and, um, and I, uh, when Frank told the story about the penguins in Argentina, which was really funny because like about 50 birds would waddle past because they put a fence so that the tourists would stay in one area. But the bottom rung of the fence was about this high so that the birds could go through. But it kept the tourists in one place. So about 50 birds would waddle past and the tourists would wait. And then the birds would say, would, there wouldn't be so many, so then they would stop. And then the tourists would go waddle past. <laughs> and when the tourists passed, then the birds would waddle across. It was really hysterical. Anyway, the other thing I saw down in, in Chinatown at the uh, LSOP on, uh, on Surmac was um, that uh, I'm just sitting, standing there waiting for the bus, and um, all, all of a sudden I see this woman um, in a coat and a hat, and she crosses the street, and about 50 birds, 50 pigeons, fly down around her, and she's putting out bread for them. And she said, now don't get me in trouble. I can hear her talking to the birds, you know. Don't get me in trouble now. Go away. Eat and go away, you know. But they knew who she was from, I don't know, wherever they were. They knew who she was, and they flew down to, and it was, it was an amazing thing. Um, so I guess the, the, the other thing that, that's been, to me, so interesting about, the, uh, the other thing about birds spreading things is that they think that after the Ice Age wiped off all of the plants and trees and everything off of North America, that the reason that the, that the, uh, that the forest grew up so fast was that blue jays and other birds who were seed eaters would eat the seeds which would go through their digestive system without being digested and they would fly over whatever and they would poop out the, the seeds and they planted all of these forests because they couldn't figure out how these forests grew up so quickly after the ice age, after the ice melted after the ice age. So they think that these birds were in fact responsible for, for the old growth forests that were present um, in the um, in the, in the when when Europeans first came to America and then cut them all down. Hmm. Um, and then the other thing that that I, I kind of know about birds that's really fascinating is that they they're very they're pretty sure that they were descendant of, of, of particular uh, parts of the dinosaur line, and that um, 
that there's something like seven commonalities between birds and dinosaurs. Like the like the dinosaurs had hollow bones, and ber birds also have hollow bones. The dinosaurs have a, a wishbone, um, as do as do birds. They have um, a bone in the female that is a calcium source for when they. Uh, for the, to make the eggs when they lay the eggs, and also that they're egg layers is another uh, common thing, and, and they have feathers. And many of the dinosaurs, uh, who were dinosaurs, also had feathers that weren't for flight, but were for warmth and probably um, mating behaviors. Um, and then that the, that Archaeopteryx was kind of the bird that revolutionized the biology in the sense that um, one year after Origin of the Species was uh, published uh, and people found out about evolution from Charles Darwin that, and, and it predicted that we would find something like this. Then they found Archaeopteryx in uh, Bavaria in the lithographic stone that they were using to make lithographs, they split it open and there was Archaeopteryx. And so the seven or so specimens that we have of Archaeopteryx are in uh, Bavaria, and there's a museum there that they're in. We were fortunate enough to see the, see the skeletons that were brought by the director of that museum to the field. And uh, it was fascinating because they also had things like the crayfish in, that were in these lithographic quality stones too and it was just like a Chinese ink and, and ink and paper drawing of, of it. It was so beautiful. Um, and, but also that the Archaeopteryx was about 120 million years old and it had modern flight feathers which was something that people really didn't it was something that scientists had to struggle with. So they figured that that was like a later evolution. And the, the ones that they found in China have been more like 150, and I think maybe as, as late as 100, or early as 170 million years old. And so they seem to be an earlier form that really did, were, were the first offshoots from the dinosaurs. And so I, the other thing that I'd like to leave you with is a joke. and. Probably people, as many people in here will remember Phil Ford and Mimi Hines. And Mimi Hines was a total stitch. But at any rate, she was this small woman and she had this huge overbite, so she kind of looked like a bird anyway. <laughs> but she, she was on Johnny Carson or something and she said, you know, we saw the ooh-ah bird. And he, Johnny says, oh, you did really? She said, yes, the ooh-ah bird, it lays square eggs. It goes, ooh! <laughs> I remember when I was a kid, my next door neighbor was uh, the son of the uh, art editor of Life magazine, uh, Guy Tudor. Uh, and Guy and I would go to uh, the Museum of Natural History, and he would spend hours <laughs> making pictures of the birds. And, the, and he became an ornithologist. Uh, anyway. Then there was a Sister Cecilia at Ascension Church uh, here uh, in, uh, in Chicago. Uh, Sister Cecilia, one of the uh, Order of St. Anne, and uh, she would feed the birds outside after Mass. Uh, and, uh, uh, she and she had names for all the different uh, uh, birds. Uh, she was worried about the uh, local hawk, of course. Uh, but really, I, I don't have many bird stories. Uh, and uh, I, 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 but but birds can be 
charming. Uh, I remember uh, we had uh, one pigeon that didn't uh, call, she called him Hoppy because he uh, had lost a, a, a toe. And uh, another pigeon uh, was uh, uh, missing a, uh, had sort of a broken wing. Uh, and uh, she, she would throw uh, her seeds to, to Hoppy and to the uh, bird with a missing wing, or uh, broken wing. Uh, but the little sparrows would, of course, uh, get there first sometimes, uh, very often. Uh, they're cute to watch, uh, but, uh, you know, uh, they're uh, birds make good pets. I remember also, uh, when I was a kid, uh, listening to the radio, there was a program, uh, I think, with uh, an organist uh, who yeah. would play, and uh, he had uh, canaries that would sing along with the organ, yeah. and uh, that was <laughs> that was charming. Uh, I remember when I was. Uh, uh, interviewing uh, to be a pastor in South Dakota. I went out to South Dakota and the, the wide plains and uh, the buttes uh, and uh, there I found canaries of all things canaries out there. And, and I don't remember much about the canaries, but, but, but I remember that they were there. And, you know what, they, they were the descendants of the canaries that the homesteaders brought out there. Ah, the homesteaders brought out canaries. Yeah. Canaries are native to Europe. Yes, yeah. uh, or the Canary, Canary Islands, Islands maybe. Yes, well. Uh, but I see that Charlie has uh, some reminiscences and I'm just going on. All right, Charlie. All right, Mr. Serial B, eclectic as usual. Let's thank our speaker chief. She actually put together her first PowerPoint. I can appreciate the photography having been engaged in the pastime for many, many years. And I must say photographing birds at least now it's a bit easier, it still is a challenge from time to time. They just don't pose for you. <laughs> um, used to be you had to discard an awful lot of film to get a good photo of a bird, you know. <laughs> and the telephoto aspects have certainly changed. That's certainly, that's one of the most radical transformations in the technology. But anyhow, thank you, thank you again, really. You put this all together for us, you know. Um, I want to be talking about the American Revolutionary War. Now, how does that relate to birds? Well, we do know this story that a British general, uh, General Johnny Burgoyne, was marching uh, with a British army of about seven and 9,000 soldiers through upstate New York, and he heard these bird sounds. As they remarked, they heard of these turkey calls. And they were wondering what it was. This the appearance, they said, what are these turkey calls? Well, it turns out they were in fact not turkeys. This was uh, General uh, Ethan Allen and the Green Mountain Boys, who were sharpshooters. And the uh, battle ensued as a result of this, which the Americans won. But uh, I was trying to think, uh, regarding Archaeopteryx, it has to be certainly the most bizarre fossil of the collection of anything found in paleontology. I'll just leave it at that. I, I'm a little question here, now dinosaurs evolved into birds, 
but according to the guy over there, dinosaurs went extinct instantaneously to, to a climatic event. So how did they evolve so quickly is the problem here. Uh, the thing that I do, I like to hike trails, and one of my favorite guides is a book called The Secret Life of the Forest. And certainly the birds constitute one of the secret lives of the forest that we often don't pertain to, uh, or pay attention to, rather. But um, it, I, I imagine they are a good indication of indicator. Yeah, certainly, since Rachel Carlson is so far an indicator of what we are doing environmentally, uh, if you measure these populations, and it's certainly one that I'm going to look a little closer into in terms of what we are doing ecologically. Uh, certainly the number of species and some of the things like you're saying, the migratory habits are changing as a result of climate change and things like that. It must be uh, really this transformation. It's, it's got to have some negative effect sooner or later in here. There's a, a cause and effect down the line. Now, I'm basically concerned with the issue of why birds sing in the first place. Um, and I really haven't spent a lot of time on this. I've only taken one course in it. It's an area called comparative psychology. And studying language and things like this, um, whether or not birds are responding to the music you're providing, that's that's a very valid hypothesis. I, I can totally concur on that. Um, the amazing thing that I was reading actually just the other day is animals communicate with each other in various ways, but humans have not been able to any engage in any commun decipher what, what they're communicating about. We've never been able to communicate with animals. And it also came up with the line like, if an aliens visit us one day, how are we ever going to figure out how to communicate with them when we can't even talk to, you know, other species? I haven't studied too much comparative psychology. It's basically guys who are trying to talk with porpoises and things like that, you know, and they weren't having much success. But it's an interesting thing. Yeah, I, I think the species, it's kind of a neat, there's a term for it here where the species interact and, you know, maybe you've got some new, I'm trying to think of a, a term for it, it escaped me at the moment where there would be some kind of bonding between the two species and you've met some common denominator, with you it's music and there it's song. Who knows, maybe that will bring us all together. Anyhow, thank you very much. Peter gets the last word. All the way in the back. Oh, well, then she the speaker gets the last word. Okay. Well, thank you very much. This was, this was fun. Yeah. Scary, but fun. Okay. <laughs> um, I have one thing to say about the sparrows and the guy who released them. Uh, I forget his name, too, but. Whoever this person was wanted to have bring all the birds that were in Shakespeare's plays. So he not only brought house sparrows, but he brought those adorable European starlings with him. And uh, house sparrows are okay. They're all over this country. They're they're just about in every major city in the world. I don't think they. I don't think the same guy got everywhere, but they probably were building nests inside uh, boats and, and, and uh, grain things. Oh, because, yeah, the, the, the origin of house sparrows. Okay. Oh, thank you. The origin of house sparrows, I just read this recently and I don't remember it exactly, but they date all the way back to the pharaoh in the grain stores. And so they're They've been associated with humanity for a long, long time. And anywhere that we have produced grain, house sparrows have followed. So that's, that's them. And 
people are really upset about house sparrows because they think they're displacing our birds, and they can they can be very ferocious, but they put up with us and they nest in cities and buildings, and I don't think bluebirds really want to build a nest in your house, this sort of thing. So I'm kind of 50-50 on house sparrows. It's not their fault. And, and uh, I just have... One thing I wanted to say is that if you if you have an opportunity to go with someone, if, if you if you've never been out looking at birds before and you have a friend who looks at birds, see if they'll take you with them with a pair of binoculars. You should you should try this. You really should because it's really amazing. I always run into, run into people when I'm down on the lakefront early in the morning, and I'll be taking a picture of something and somebody will be walking by and they'll say, you know, what are you looking at? And I'll just hand them the binoculars and I'll say, okay, it's this and look at that. And there you always get this, oh, wow, look at that. You can't, you can't get that for free anywhere else. I mean, this, this is, it's there, it's out there. It's just, it's, it's an amazing experience. And the other thing is that if you're a musician, please, those, those two days a year that we have when you can open the windows and you don't have to turn on the air and you don't have to turn on the heat, it's just like a gorgeous day. If you're playing, play for the, play, play for the, the outside, play for nature, listen to the birds, they'll enjoy it, and you will too. Thank you.